The following interview was conducted with Doris Pearson, Secretary Emeritus to the Board of Trustees for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on um, Thursday, uh, September the 25th, 2008, in, uh, at Stewart Center. The interview is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Doris. Thank you very much. Tell Thank us you for inviting me. Okay. Tell us where you were born and your parents in early years. I was born here in Lafayette, but my parents had a very small farm in Benton County, and my first six and a half to seven years were spent on a farm. My playmates were the farm animals. I guess that's where my love for animals started. When I was nearly seven, we moved to Oxford, Indiana, in Benton County, which was a city in my eyes compared to having spent time on the farm. I well recall my first day at the larger school. I went home at recess because I thought school was over. But I started my school years in a very small school called Wadena, which is now torn down in Benton County, and I believe the first six grades were housed in one room. So that was the that beginning was of tough. my education. What an experience, though. Mm -hmm. It was, and ironically, one of my classmates in the first grade at Wadena followed me uh, to Oxford. His family chose to move also, and he and I went through public school together, and we've been very close friends ever since. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, after grade school, what, then tell us about high school and what you did. High school? Yeah, you know, where you went and High school activities. was also spent at Oxford. The grade school was a separate building from the high school. They but were we close together. Oh, yes, yes, very close together. And we lived in town, so naturally I could walk to school. And uh, there was just my mother and myself, so... Had your father passed away? Yes, oh. we did not have an automobile, and I learned to do all the fun things on foot or bicycle, Good. and once in a while, uh, one of the older boys, you know, would have a car, but uh, my high school days were spent at Oxford, and I liked school. Good. Were there any clubs or activities that you were Oh, involved? yes, there were a lot of... Um, I was in all of the music activities, and I was in all of the, um, back in those days, they were probably called business, uh, shorthand, typing, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Do you take some of those classes? Oh, yes. Oh, good. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Okay. I loved the, right. b the business, and, right. and I loved history. I did not do exceptionally well in math. As soon as I could test out, I, I passed math and science, but they, they weren't passed. my favorite. Right, okay. No, no, no. What about athletics? Is there gym or athletics, anything like that? I school? loved sports, but I was not good in sports. I was probably the biggest and tallest girl always through school, and I was clumsy. However, I think that uh, being good with the business end of uh, the curriculum in high school, the basketball coach, who happened to be a neighbor of ours and knew that I could not afford to do some of the things the other kids did, asked me to be a statistician for all of the ball games. So I was able to go to all of the home and uh, away games free of charge because he wrote a pass for me and I kept I sat at the end of the bench where the basketball players sat and uh, I kept certain stats for the coach super mm -hmm. yeah, that's great mm -hmm. that's nice I never saw a football game until I was at Purdue so it was primarily basketball did basketball they, they baseball they track did, did they not have football at the oh school? no no oh, okay okay no. What now, approximately what years were there, and what was the... Uh, okay, uh, I entered um, high school in 50, 50, 49 to 50, okay. because okay. I graduated in 53. Okay. And I graduated from high school in 1953, and in how May. Large was the, how large was the class, how many students? 
there were 16 of us, eight boys and eight girls. Oh, my. Of the 16, two have since passed on. Most of us are, are very close. Of the 16, only two graduated from college and a third attended a university, but she did not graduate. I did not attend a university because I was married in July after I graduated from high school in May, and my husband was in the Marine Corps and we moved to California. So I was a child bride, homesick in California amongst mostly a few older people, career people, and um, my memories of California aren't always the fondest. I was glad to get back to where Indiana. Where did you meet your husband, and, and was he from, from where you were? Yeah, but he, he had his, been, he, his sister lived in Oxford, and he was uh, older. He had, was in the service already? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And then what went after? After what? the service, yeah. we uh, came back to Lafayette. Did you spend uh, his time in, in uh, California until he got out of the service? Oh, yes. Oh, okay, mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay. But I was homesick. Yes, that's <laughs> quite a distance. That's a long way. You know. <laughs> did you do? Did you work while you were out there? No, I was approached, but I didn't. Okay. Okay. I wasn't there long enough to, f and I didn't have a car. Um, did you live on the base? No, oh, okay. we lived off base. Okay. So. Okay. Right. It was an experience. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was very immature. But it was an. An eye opener, for mm -hmm, want of a mm -hmm, better term. Mm -hmm, okay, then brings you back to Lafayette. What is he? He was from this area, so he decided oh, yes. to come back oh, here. Oh yes. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. And then what? What transpired next? Okay. Uh, we how came, about your career path before you, before you came to Purdue? Okay. Well, my career path began at Purdue. Okay. Okay. We arrived back in Indiana in the late fall of uh, nineteen. Fifty-three. Early in 1954, probably January, I came to Purdue because my father-in-law worked at Purdue and my mother-in-law worked at Purdue. And if you get a job at Purdue, that's the place to be. During my high school years, I worked in various offices in the small town, so I knew I liked office work. I applied at Purdue, and in 1954, probably in February, I started in the education department. In the industrial education curriculum, that's why I knew about your shops. Um, it's a rather small staff. What, do you remember what, what building was that at Oh, it was in the education building. Oh, the old education mm -hmm, building, mm -hmm. which the top is now floor. where Bering Hall is mm -hmm. for researchers. Mm -hmm. the top, I, we were housed in the top floor, no air conditioning, and in the summer the blinds were pulled and the floor fans ran. In 1957, I became pregnant and the steps soon became too, too much, and there was not maternity leave. However, the head of the curriculum was so kind, he held open my spot and filled in with someone else, which is unheard of. I mean, they didn't do that then, um, so I that's fortunate he was able to work that out. Mm -hmm. We worked it out, and I tried coming back, but it, I was still living in Oxford. The 20 miles with a newborn in those days. It's hard. And the lady who filled in for me really wanted my job anyway, so it all worked out. What was your first child, boy or girl? My first and only is a boy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So early in 1958, I left the university, terminated, which is the only thing you could do in those days, decided to be a stay-home mom, and I was for a short time, and a gentleman from the insurance agency right there in Oxford approached me. I could walk to work, and the hours were great. 
and I could watch my son grow. My mother took care of him, which was a great help. She was very instrumental in his early years, in his reading and so forth. So I worked in an insurance office for about seven or eight years. Mm-hmm. What was your, where was your husband employed? What was he doing? He managed a grain elevator at Otterburn. Okay. okay. So he drove to Otterburn and, you know, okay. small town stuff, but at that time... That's nice. Oxford had a theater. Oxford had a beautiful swimming pool and park. And Oxford had a bowling alley. And my son couldn't have asked for more. Oh, no. Great. And we, we could walk to the theater... I think we saw every movie that was ever shown, and sometimes we went back a second time. I think, what, it was 25 cents ago? <laughs> when I started going, it was 10 cents, you know, up until a certain age, and then if you squinched your legs down, you could get in still for 10 cents. <laughs> I think that's... Yeah. My son's kind of a movie buff still. Right. Oh, he yeah. started at an early age. Right, exactly. <laughs> I like the movies as well, <laughs> even on the VCR. <laughs> oh. Then what happened? Did, uh, what brought you? Oh, and we came back to Purdue, I guess. The insurance business was interesting, but it was not my cup of tea. It was family owned. I was not a member of the family, although they treated me like one. No complaints whatsoever, but I, I just missed something. I don't know why or what sure. at the time. I was still young. And I thought, I'd like to come back to Purdue. I didn't come directly to Purdue. I was hired by the CIC, the Committee on Institutional Cooperation. I'm sure you've heard of it. Our staff office was on Northwestern where the uh, PEFQ facility is now located. It was a beautiful English-type tutor home, but it was a staff office. There were couple of offices upstairs and my office was downstairs with the kitchen and a library. It was wonderful. That is where I really was able to interact with deans and vice presidents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Not that I couldn't in education, but it was Contact on a Mr. much lower level. Sure. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. nice. Mm-hmm. And then then the CIC moved. That staff office would take turns being at different universities, and it uh, moved to Northwestern. Was it a large office that was here, or not? Was it there nice were staff? no about four of us. Oh, okay, okay. It was nice because you were near campus. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh yes. Oh yeah. That was how I first met John Hicks. Did he drop in there? Oh, he dropped in all the time because he was a very good friend of the head of the CIC, and uh, I think he was Purdue's rep. Each Big Ten school had a rep. And they still, I think the provost is the representative. I think so, yeah, yeah, I think I so. Think so. Right. so John was always bebopping in. The CIC moved to Evanston. I flew to Evanston every week on Monday and came home, I think, Wednesday or Thursday. Oh, wow. So you continued working for them when they moved? Mm-hmm. Oh, for wow. a short time, yeah. just so they could get started and they were tra- so they could uh, train a new staff, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's nice. Mm-hmm. That one worked mm-hmm. out well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. good. Came back. John knew that I was unemployed, so to speak. I did spend a few weeks helping out in the biology department in the graduate studies office. And uh, John's office called and said that uh, Miss Skinner would be retiring from the uh, secretary's office of the board of trustees. Would I like to interview? I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Small town girl. I worked very hard, and I worked with Miss Skinner for almost a year. And she's forgotten everything that you know I knew. That that she's it was nice that you had that much of a transition because oftentimes that's not the case. 
you retire and then you're gone. So the transition was easy. Sure. And then John Hicks stepped in and uh, he served as an interim secretary for uh, six months or so. Well, now, she, excuse me, she was secretary to the board. She, uh, she'd been secretary for a long time. Oh, yes. Okay. As it, you well know, her father was the first dean of the School of Ag. Yes, that's right. Mary Lib. Well, that's what people refer to her. That's right. Mary Lib probably could tell you where and when each building on campus. Because she was raised here. Yes. All right. Yeah. I was sort of a, quote, outsider. And maybe it was good because I had a different perspective sure. of, the, of the trustee's office. Was it in the same location that it is oh, now? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. right. so at Huffy Hall. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Okay. What, what did she do after she, she's deceased now, is she? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did she stay on here uh, in the community? Yes, she oh. did. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. She was a very good friend of uh, Bob Cook and Bev Stone. I think Ann Kirker knew her too as well Probably. from um, who was the veterinary medical library? Because I think I'm they sure. were. Mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. Anne was the class of '33, mm -hmm. as I recall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh yes, Mary Lib carried a lot of weight. She ruled with an iron thumb, iron fist. A lot of the secretaries on the floor were about half afraid of her. She had a heart of gold. She was the sweetest person I've ever known. But her job was her life. Right. While she was there, That's she right. had a lot of outside activities, but. Right. But she was a when she good was here, uh -huh. yeah, right? She was okay. a good teacher. Okay, let's talk a little bit about tell for the research. What's the duties and responsibilities of the secretary? The to secretary the to the board. Right. Yeah. Well, they're spelled out in the bylaws. But you're, you, you're the liaison, and do you? What about uh, you? You're the minute. Ta you take the minutes. Oh yes, she's right. responsible for taking all of the minutes. Of, uh, in those days, would that be by hand? Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's a challenge. Did you have shorthand? Mm -hmm. That's needed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you can do, uh, with the recorders, uh, you can do speed writing or sure. some shorthand. Mm -hmm. But sitting through, when I first started, our board meetings were two days, and to sit through two days of taking shorthand, your hand was numb by the end of the day. I bet. Right. Yeah. What, uh, what about agenda? Tell us a little bit about some of the other things that you right. did. The secretary, when I first came to the office, was the liaison person between the board and the administrators, namely the president and the vice presidents. The uh, central, central administration. The central, yes. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. And I was told by Dr. John Hicks that I should perform my duties with pride, which I felt that I did, and uh, don't make any waves, Doris. <laughs> So, reading between the lines, I soon knew when to keep my mouth shut, bite my tongue. I never repeated anything that I heard or saw. But back to the duties, uh, we were responsible, the separate, that, that the board office was responsible for putting together the agenda of the board meetings. Um, collecting all of the background material for the meeting, which could, you know, sometimes, you've seen the piles of uh, documents for just one meeting. Take the minutes, distribute the minutes, help plan all of the committee meetings. Now there are various committee meetings. Were there, are there more committees now of the board yes. than it? Oh, okay. Right. When, when the, there are the same committees they did not function in the when I first started in the 70s like they function now. Okay. And how would that, you want to make a comment on that? To, that you well, prior to each board meeting, now, I think most all of the committees have a meeting. Whereas when you were in the earlier days, the no, committee they did met. Not. Okay. 
they didn't meet unless they were called upon, unless there was an, an item or a matter that a certain committee needed to act upon or discuss. That's the only time those committees were really very active. Okay. Back to the agenda question. Mm -hmm. Did you, you said it, but was that in conjunction with the chairman of the board? Or? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. You were, so it was a, a consensus as to what yes, was going to be Yes, yes. There was much responsibility. And during uh, President Jiski's term, well, from the very beginning, the role of the secretary's office was diminished somewhat because President Jiski was a very strong person, and he had a staff that he felt need to be, needed to be more involved with what we were doing. So consequently, uh, he had a much greater say-so about the agenda items than the other presidents. Okay. Okay. Dr. Beering was quite involved, but he left it up to those of us who needed to put the things together. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's probably the, what the committees would be more standing committees, but maybe now there are subcommittees or something like that. So I don't. I don't really know. I'm not sure. Well, they are spelled out in, in the, the bylaws. bylaws. Correct. Okay. Okay. What, and what is your liaison with the, with the chairman? Do you sort of do, now when the minutes are done, or does a draft go out to the board before the final minutes are set? No, the draft goes only to the president of the university and to the central administrators who have a large presentation to make. They edit their presentation to be okay. a part of the minutes. Okay. Another question, there are some executive sessions, mm -hmm. and those are just minutes, are, there's minutes taken, but they're internal, they're not the public ones, okay? Because mm -hmm. yeah. they, they will address that in agendas that whatever, so you see that. Okay. And now the agenda is available, I print that out so then, and, the, and um, know what the dates and things of that mm -hmm. sort, and now, as you probably know, we are, there, the library uh, archives and special collections is scanning the Board of Trustees minutes. The older ones. The older ones. Right, yeah. And we're in those big books and things. Yes. Right. Then, are there no longer minute books? Well, they're still there, but, um, but we're scanning them so for preservation purposes. Oh, that's good. Right. That's wonderful. And they had to do some transcription, uh, um, Carl Snow, before they could scan them in because they wanted to be sure that everything. And it's amazing that they've lasted this long, and they're in pretty good shape. You know, they really are. <clears throat> See what else here. I talked about that, and the minutes now, um, not necessarily with with shorthand though. They're probably using recorder. Definitely using a recorder. Okay, okay, and that makes it a little bit easier. I believe Rosanna does take shorthand. She probably speed writes too, like I have to do. Okay, okay, all right. Now you had some. Uh, president Hansen was the president when you came. That's quite interesting. Okay. And one of the quotes that the others have said to me that the primary major responsibility of the Board of Trustees is the election of the president of the university. That's one of the major things, among other things too, but that's kind of key. And, oh, yes. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you can see the reasoning behind that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But go ahead, you were going to talk about Dr. Hansen. He was the first, Could, he was president when you got no, on the board? Really, oh. Dr. Hudney was. Oh, he was still here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. I've forgotten about that. Okay. When I first came to the university, I would get off the bus. I rode a bus from Oxford to West Lafayette every morning and every evening back home. I would get off the bus at Northwestern and come down the um, mall and pick up the mail at the uh, basement of Hovde and walk over to the uh, education building. Now that was when we didn't even have parking permits at Purdue. So there wasn't much traffic. In any event, could when you I park would... On, could, excuse me, could you park on campus? Oh, heavens yes. Could I could park right in front of the... Uh, after I learned to drive and had a car, I parked right in front of the education building. And you didn't need a <laughs> No, they didn't have permits. Oh, Lordy. Interesting. They soon... Got around to that, oh, sure, right. right soon. Yeah. But as I would walk down the, the 
central mall area into the executive building, I thought, gee, I wonder what it's like to work in Hovde Hall. Because we always call it the executive building. Sure. Right. Which, for research, it was named mm -hmm. for that for a long mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, interesting. And it came about. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Hovde always presented himself as such a statesman. Carried himself in a very pictures in the debris with the oh, yes, yes. and also the commencement you know at the Oxford kind oh of yes, yes right well then but when you went on the board was he he was still the president or not? no no oh, he no dr. Hansen came I believe in 1971 right. at about the July 1 right I think so mm -hmm. right. and that's about the time I started in at the board office mm -hmm. so we came at the same time well, that's very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and of course he was the first one to live in in Westwood. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. that's nice. And his door was always open. His office door was always open to us, and his the door of his home was always open. You see him would be in the same location where Dr. Jeske is yes. in that corner thing there, mm -hmm. and that's where Dr. Cordova is. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's normally the president's that same area there. Okay, and here just down the hall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hansen was one of the the kindest, nicest persons I've ever known. Mary's a nice person. I, I met his wife a couple of times, you know. Nancy, his, his wife, you know. And, uh, and then you had, let's see, then Dr. Hicks was there for a short time, mm -hmm. and then Dr. Baring and Dr. Jeske. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the um, student trustee. That came on board about 75, Five. I think. Mm -hmm. Larry Greasehaber was the first student trustee. Larry, I believe, is still located in the St. Louis area. Mary Lou? Larry, L-A-R-R-Y, oh. okay. Greasehaber, G-R-I-E-S-H-A-B-E-R, I believe. Okay. Okay. It's been Sounds a while. Good. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. That's good to know. And now that, and that was kind of, but before that they had somebody that was just sort of a speaking seat, but the, this has a voting seat too, so that kind of brought the board. And then you have, were you involved at all in meeting with the new members or do, working with them and getting them in, indoctrinated onto the board or? The student trustees? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Usually he or she would come to the office and we would sit down and I would explain some things to them. Quite often they would come with another trustee, but the same was true for a new trustee. <coughs> he or she would most generally stop by and we would sit down and have a nice chat. Sure. Did they like to look at uh, the previous minutes or? Well, I don't know if they liked to or not. They were provided with previous minutes. <laughs> it's like you're the mission, right? Yeah, gotcha. yeah. They were provided with uh, certain documents, you know. Sure. That they would need in their duties and responsibilities. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, back to the secretary. You said that you're appointed. Now, do they re uh, reappoint? How does the secretary that come to the board is elected. Oh. It's an elected office. Consequently, he or she might not be elected, and then you would be out of a job. Wow. Even though I was an employee of Purdue and I had all the Purdue benefits, um, they could have chosen not to reelect me. If, mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. huh. no, most people don't. No, they just think that you're there until you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, decide to leave. And then which has been the case, <laughs> right? Is it a, was it for three years? It's every two years. Every two years. So you're serving. Okay. In other words, you're serving at the pleasure of. You the are serving at the pleasure of the board of trustees. Okay. Okay. Um, did uh, one of the things that they try to have a meeting off campus mm -hmm. once mm -hmm. is that that was sort of tradi that that goes normally that was a, a thing that they would do. Not all the meetings would be on campus. They could have one off campus. Yes, they prefer to have one off campus. Okay. And they sort of rotate. Yes. Mm -hmm. That has become much more, uh, I don't want to say popular. In my early years with the trustees, we did not meet off campus that often. It might have been every two years or so, but now it's one campus a year mm -hmm. at least right what about commencement were you involved in getting the we were, de de yes, details yes yes we were very involved during dr. Be uh, Bering's tenure we sort of split some of the responsibilities his office handled 
part of the commencement responsibilities. Now, this is for the platform party, the honorary degree candidates, that type of thing. Sure, right. Okay. And then what, what would you be handling then? We handled the robing for the platform party and all of the trustee functions for commencement. Dr. Beering's office handled uh, the functions for the honorary degree uh, recipients, the dinner, that type of thing, okay. which we were all involved with too. We worked very closely sure, together. Right. Mm -hmm. Did they it's have very a, interesting. Yeah. Did they have a dinner? Uh, yes. After, now, normally in May there's always been four mm -hmm. commencements. Okay. There is a dinner prior to the Saturday evening commencement and the honorary degree recipients are at that dinner with their spouses and some bring a family mm -hmm. member or two. All of the trustees and central administrators. It's quite a nice function. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now they have it at West it's been at Westwood for mm -hmm. a, a mm -hmm. period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how about some awards and honors, of which really nice. You're the Secretary Emeritus, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, tell us, tell us what, uh, and also tell you got your Sagamore. How did those come about? Were you surprised? I was shocked. Good, mm -hmm. that's good. Mm -hmm. Did they, uh, when did they give you the Sagamore? When you decided, to, did you you decide to retire? Mm -hmm. They gave me the Sagamore at uh, the first board meeting after I retired. I came back. That's nice. What made you decide that you, that you wanted to uh, retire? Because you probably could stay on, or you had other things you wanted to do. It was time. Were you still commuting back and forth? Oh, no. We moved to West Lafayette in the 60s. Oh, okay. So that made it easier. Mm -hmm. West Lafayette in the, air, in the rural area. No, it was much easier. Um, a combination of things. I always had excellent health, but prior to my leaving, when I decided, I had the flu and the shingles at the same time, and the shingles scared the living daylights out of me, and I thought, and was told that they are sometimes caused by stress. And I had served with enough precedents. I thought, it's just time time to do some of the things I've always wanted to do. I laughed about always wanting to quilt. And my family gave me beautiful quilting materials and lovely quilting books, and I have not quilted the first stitch. <laughs> Uh, it's, that's okay. We, you, it, you can still do that. Um, campus changes, uh, the, the, how the campus has changed during your tenure of the board. Certainly the buildings. For the buildings. Thing. Right. The smokestack, of course. The bell tower. Yes. However, back to my days in the uh, education building, the train operated daily. I remember the train going through here when I came because I've been here a long time. I know, mm -hmm. right? I know where the tracks were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and the driving problems on campus, uh, big change. As I mentioned to you, in the 50s, you could park right beside your buildings. Of course, there weren't as many buildings and there certainly weren't as many students or staff. Right. Speaking of staff, uh, you were the only person there, or did you have some help in the when well, you were the secretary to the board? To the board? Yeah. When I, Mary Leib and another lady were uh, the office staff, so to speak, but then uh, her assistant left, so that's how I filtered in. When Mary Leib retired, John Hicks asked me if I needed someone right away. And I said, I'd like to have a feel for it because I'm relatively new before a new person comes in and we both stumble. Right. And I had such good help on the floor from other people. Sure. 
everyone pitches in and yes know. yes and in those days there weren't as many and there weren't as many people on the second floor of Harvey so they all sort of knew the ins and outs sure. I had good friends good help then we hired halftime Rosanna was a halftimer excellent very mature we were able to uh, get Rosanna hired full-time and she just slowly but surely learned the ropes it wasn't slowly but it was surely um, I couldn't have asked for anyone any yeah. do um do you have many people that drop in that want to use the minutes that you have in there? We used to years oh. ago when we first when I first started. Yes, as time passed, no. Well, now of course they're available, you know, electronically. Mm -hmm. But I've known mm -hmm. people over time who've been doing who want our, our trustee run is not very extensive in the archives, mm -hmm. and they'd be doing some books so they would go over there and right, try right, to use right. them. So and you probably get some calls too, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, people mm -hmm, that would mm -hmm, want to have to mm -hmm, uh, use it. Back to John Hicks, was he kind of your contact or your liaison? Was he, uh, he well, when he was president, then he would go to the uh, board meetings, but he also, being the executive assistant, and that's was he would also attend yes, them. Yes, absolutely. Okay. In fact, during Dr. Hansen's tenure, John Hicks was my go-to person. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John did a, when he was the... Um, interim president mm -hmm. gave a talk and I was at it for some student organization he said well you know I'm not going to be here too long so I said you want to come up to my office come in and I got a teddy bear and you can come take a look at it whatever you know mm -hmm. oh, dear. that was John yeah yeah it's very mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. he brought some stuff for the archives one time too mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. about Chauncey Village how that that's changed over time hasn't it I haven't been out there lately well, I got more things than they were years mm -hmm. ago because mm -hmm. even when I came, there mm -hmm. weren't as you know quite as many. There was mm -hmm. the drugstore, and, mm -hmm. and Va well, Vons wasn't there. Well, Vons was there, but then they had Arts the, Drug Works. Yes, and they had a nice uh, ice cream shop. Yes, that's right. The bookstore, of course, was mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. Bollocks was there, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. all that in that oval area has really changed a lot. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little about your post Purdue life. What you've been doing? I spend every minute that I can outdoors in the yard and garden. Good. And you still live in the same house? Yes. Okay. okay. We built in 1967. We're in the same house. How did you happen to select that, that area? We wanted an area in the, quote, country, <laughs> which is no longer in the is country. Is it really built up around you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, even driving out 26, I know there's a difference, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But we aren't on top of each other, but we do have neighbors, sure, of course. Right. What about your son? What does your, uh, does your son live here too? No, my son is in, lives in Austin, Texas. He, he graduated from Purdue. Art history, I believe it was. Uh, went to New York City, tried his best. As a painting, I mean, as, as a an artist. artist. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Worked to support himself in a art supply. It must have been a very large art supply, shop, store, whatever. That's where he met his wife. She had two degrees, <laughs> and she just couldn't quite find her niche either. She was also a painter. She did paint. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. She was from Brooklyn. Always lived in New York. Had never even been to Indiana until they were married. They came to Lafayette. Purchased a very, very, very old house. Renovated it. They lived upstairs and rented out the bottom. Refinished furniture. Uh, she was unhappy from day one. Homesick. I mean, this was not New York. She convinced him to come back to New York, and they lived in Brooklyn for a while. They purchased land in Upper New York, where it snows in October and you don't see the ground until May. Then my son hated every, he hates winters anyway, 
and he was so unhappy, and she was unhappy, and she was married to her job in, in uh, where they working in New York, uh, in uh, Ithaca, mm. close to Cornell. Okay. And she was married to her job, so after ten years, that that, that was it. She purchased uh, his interest in the property, and he had always liked Texas because we had family down there, and he loves the warm weather. So he moved to Texas, and he's he's and content he, down there. He likes it. Is he is he doing something in the art area? Very little. He is in. I don't want to say construction. He's a glorified handyman. He puts in cabinets, does floors, paints, roofs. Those are key people. Mm -hmm. They're hard to find. They are. They're hard He's to always find. busy. And he does have a real estate license. He now has a license to be a home inspector. People who purchase homes, you know, need to get a loan, that type of thing. Yeah, so he's trying to do more and more of that. He's also, <laughs> but he's not going to do this, after he took all the classes and uh, seminars, et cetera, et cetera, licensed with FEMA to go in <laughs> after. It's been a, a busy year. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> after their FEMA's disaster in New Orleans, Stan called a couple of weeks ago and said, I don't think I want to do uh, this hurricane here. He said, they'll shoot me on sight. Okay. So I don't think he's going to continue with that. No, no. Probably got a wise move. I guess you can make good money if you go at it like a house of fire, but you're going to make mistakes and step on people's toes. He's not cut out for that yeah, at all. That's, that's risky, but yeah, that's a better off mm -hmm. not to. Okay, how about uh, favorite Purdue tradition? Got one of them. Got one. The favorite Purdue tradition. Oh, I loved it when the seniors wrote on their cords and had their beanies, and marched to as a group to the football games. That is a favorite, and I do enjoy the band. Yes. Prior to the football marching in, you know. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. How about do you have an outstanding event in your life? In my life. Mm -hmm. My outstanding event was the birth of my son. Good. That's good. And in closing, any comments and general comments that you'd like to share for the re with the researchers about the board or anything you've done, thinking it through? It's been such an honor and privilege to have known so many outstanding people who have contributed to Purdue. You know, to have walked the same halls, followed in their footsteps. Uh, interacted. Yes. Had the privilege to sit down and be part of their family. I never dreamed that, you know, a little gal from Oxford High School would ever have walked the halls of Hovde. I just can't say enough good things about Purdue. That's good. That's nice. And about the presidents, and about the trustees, and the administrators. You know, you could go on and on and on. I do think the board, the nine members, when I first joined the office, will always have a fond spot in my heart because they sort of took me under wing. And you went together forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's nice. In fact, one of those nine lives in Austin, and I see her and talk to her when I visit. Nancy Myers. Good. Most of that original, my original board are gone, but Nancy's still living, and Tom Graham is still living. Mm -hmm. You probably heard of the Graham Farms. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think most of his children are Purdue grads. Tom has a pretty good-sized family. Um, the board, um, 
was originally nine, but now ten because of the student mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, trustee. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And they welcome the student trustee. Oh, yes. Oh. No problem yeah. whatsoever. Oh, sure. I don't think. Um, For the researchers, I'm going to say that this was in a legislative, yes, not a university. Yes, uh, So that they. They were mandated. For clarifi clarification of that. Yes. Um, same is true for the other Indiana universities. Mm -hmm. That's right. And did and you interacted with them, you know, in some social events too. So you got to know them after the meetings. You started to get together. Oh heavens, huh? yes. We were always included. Yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Most generally, unless it was an executive session that. Sure. Right. Behind the scenes type of thing. In fact, uh, Mr. Hillenbrand, who. Um, has the hospital beds, Hill Rom. He has a beautiful farm around Batesville. He would have us once a year out to the farm, just the trustees, you know, and the officers. Meet. Yes. That I like. Yes. <laughs> Those days, quite frankly, are gone. These people now are too busy. It's another generation. I understand. Need I say more? That's right. Thank you, Doris. This concludes the interview. Thank you very much.